Those of you of a particular age might remember the advert for shredded wheat. And their famous strap line was, nothing added, nothing taken away. Yeah, nothing added, nothing taken away. Well, God got there first. Okay, so here in the start of Deuteronomy 4, it says there in verse 2, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. That's a really important principle. Why might be might we be tempted to add to it? Well, for some, they would say, well, there aren't enough laws there. They'd actually want to have more and more and more laws uh, and extra things. Perhaps make themselves feel a bit proud. Well, I did that, and I keep it better than you because I've got these extra laws, and I keep those as well. Taking away from it. Well, you know how some of us, we just say, well, I'm a bit... Well, you wouldn't admit to it, but a bit lazy. You say, well, I don't want to do that part. That bit, that's all right for him and her. But for me, you know, I'll just stick to the basics. And so this principle of don't add and don't take away, really, really important here. Every part of it is important. Think of what Jesus said when he spoke to those important religious people of his day. He said that they were, yes, they were good in making sure they applied the law to the tiniest part of their lives. So apparently the, the spices, the herbs they grew in their garden, they were giving a tenth of those <coughs> to the offering of the Lord. And he said, well, that's good that you do that. But the huge weighty issues of love and mercy and justice, you know, care for the poor and things like that, they weren't doing those things. Elephant in the room, as we would say these days. They weren't doing what was needed. And they should have done all of it, Jesus said. Yes, don't neglect the 10%, because it shows that you, you love God. You're prepared to give him everything. That he requires of you. That's a good thing. So nothing added, nothing taken away. Now, I know this perhaps to our ears is a long chapter, but don't forget when this book, when this uh, what we call Deuteronomy, when this was first preached, it was done as a whole thing, all at once, for all people, the whole nation. That's quite something, isn't it? And for all ages, it wasn't just that the children had to go elsewhere. So they all would have heard all these uh, 34 chapters. Massive. And so he calls the people at the beginning, Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. He's saying this as an intermediary, as it was a go-between, between him and the Lord, between him and the people. And he says, follow them so that you may live. And that live is almost in two parts. Because we can live as in be alive. Yes, he's saying that we might stay alive. We won't be consumed by God's anger. But there's another sense in which we can really live. You know, you know, we, you know sometimes we go on holiday and we say, this is really living. You know, we're out on the out in the sea and the you know it's like a, a bath water temperature you know and the, the it's got white sand and palm trees and we go, oh this is really living or whatever your imagination of, of a beautiful part of earth is but what we're talking about here is really living living god's way so follow these laws so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land the lord the god of your fathers is giving you again it's a promise it's a certain promise he's saying yes you can hold on to this he is going to give it to you there's no question about it he does what he says but will you do what you say you've promised before him that you would do his will that he you would obey the law you keep to it don't add to what 
he commands. Don't take away, don't subtract from it, but keep the commands the Lord your God gives you. And there he gives that, that solemn warning in verse 3. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor, a place where they worship foreign gods, gods of other nations. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. But all of you held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. It's an object lesson. You imagine that. You know, we look around us and we think, you know, well, so, so-and-so's died. They died of old age. They died of cancer, whatever it might be. Imagine if you knew that the God that you worshipped was the God who actually struck down those people, who struck down dead, you know, your relative, your friends. They're dead, not because of cancer, but they're dead because you saw with your own eyes the Lord do away with their lives at that point. Quite shocking, really, isn't it? Thinking about it. It's an object lesson. They've got that all around them in the nation. And so he goes on to say, See, I've taught you decrees and laws as, my, as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. It's not just about doing these things uh, and, and it almost being self-contained. You're kind of living in a, a bubble, or not even a bubble, because it's almost like in a cave. You, nobody else can see them. How you live is obvious to other people. How you live, what drives you, is obvious. You either present a, a good example or a bad one. You're a good influence or a bad influence. And that's what this verse is saying. And Moses is saying, well, as you live as a people, you're not hidden behind a rock somewhere. You're visible. And how you live, if you live for the Lord, they will say, surely this nation is a, is a great nation. It has a wise and understanding people. And they'll say that because God's laws are wise. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them in the way the Lord our God is near us? We pray to him. It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? No other nation. What other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? And so he's asking that question. And as they hear it, they go, no, there's no other nation. So how they, they think, wow, we're privileged. This is amazing. You know, it stirs their heart up like nothing else. You know, we hear today perhaps about inspirational speeches. You know, with certain people going in front of big crowds of people, maybe in a, in a, in a university somewhere, or somewhere like that. But this is above all that. This is greater than that. This isn't just saying to these people, perhaps a bunch of university students, you've achieved, well done, you know, as they stand there as a sea of people with their mortar boards and gowns and all proud of their achievements. Go on further. That's about the pride of men. That's about the pride of mankind. It's about the belief in, in being humans. That's not enough. We need to say how good, how great is God and how we can know him and feel, yes, this is the one who leads us, needs to lead us. And that's why he keeps saying things like this. This is verse 9 now. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as as you live. To Moses here, he's reflecting the pastoral love God has for his people. As you hear each of these sentences, you can tell it's coming from the heart of a, a, a kind leader who's been put, Moses is being put in that role by the Lord who only wants the best for the nation. This nation that he's raised up from Abraham. 
Yes, I believe Moses here is reflecting the, the pastoral love God has for his people. But it's not all plain sailing. It's not you know, falling, as it were, you know, falling off a log. It's not as easy to do as that. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything here at all. It would just be blank pages. If it came naturally, no, we have to follow it. We have to read it, follow it, learn it. Watch yourselves closely. You know, we find it easy to judge others, don't we? We're always passing comment on other people, whether it's a person we've never met before, you know, maybe on the, on the internet, you know, on the phones, we say, oh, so-and-so is in trouble again, or, oh, they're doing quite well, or whatever. We're making judgments all the time. Or somebody, a neighbour, somebody in our family, even the person who we're talking to now, we might make a judgment of good or bad. We find it easy to judge other people, don't we? But we need to watch ourselves closely. We need to be judging ourselves as well. So don't forget the things God has done or let them slip from your heart. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Let them slip from your heart. Now, of course, when we talk about the heart, it's not about the organ that pumps blood around our bodies. We're talking about what we love. And what we love, what's in our hearts, that will direct our behaviour. So make sure that God and all he has done is top priority in your life. And when we do that, what happens next? Oftentimes, who do we love the most in our, in our society? We say we love our children most of all, don't we? Why is that? We love them. Well, they came from us. Uh, they they came, came from our own loins, as it were. Um, you know, for you as, uh, as women who are mothers, you know, you've, you've been uh, their, their very place of life and growth from the very start. The closeness that you feel. And there's nothing wrong in that, of course. But if you love them, well, you're going to do the next verse. Teach them to your children. Because if you truly love your children, you're going to give them what is best. You're not going to say, hey, eat this. It's a load of rubbish. You're not going to scrape some stuff off the floor and shove it in their mouths. Neither should we be blasé about what they consume with their minds. Teach them to your children. Teach these laws, these commands to your children and to their children after them. So in other words, ch your children and your grandchildren. So important. Because if we don't hand it down, what happens? It gets lost. Every generation I hear, well, it's not the same as it used to be. You know, we've lost something. We've lost what we had before in the previous day had respect for their parents we're partly to blame for that if we're connecting that generation with this one then something something's been lost in the translation hasn't it between those generations our parents and our children and so that's why we need to teach these things to our children and to our grandchildren or they were to teach them to their children and grandchildren. Verse 10, remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. So that's the mountain of the Lord, the mountain. And it was a terrifying experience there when he said to me, when the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land. This isn't just a case of Oh, well, I, I heard it at the time, and it sounded good, but then I wandered away, and I'm doing my own thing. I'm just mixing it with a bit of worldly wisdom. No. This is that they might follow all their lives to revere, to respect the Lord as long as they live, every day of their lives. And they might teach those things to their children you came near 
and you stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens. Imagine that. They were seeing that with their own eyes. And God is here in a very powerful way with black clouds and deep darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. And you, he declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow. And he wrote them on those two stone tablets. The Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. It keeps looking back. It keeps looking forward. This connection with the, the recent past and saying, yeah, this is where you received the Ten Commandments when you heard the voice of the Lord. And it was all to do with believing now and believing as you go into the future with him. As you follow him, you're possessing the land. And he, re he reiterates there in verse 15, where he's just said, you saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you. And this is a thing that we have a hang-up about. You know, we, are, we often... We're attracted as humans you know, to, the, to, to real things, to images, to things that we can see. So we say, well, I want to I see God. I wanna, what does God look like? We imagine him to be like this, like that. And that's, that's, our, that's to our downfall. Because we need to keep coming back to this verse here in Deuteronomy 4.15. You saw no form. I know it's not us, it's the Israelites. But there was no form there given to them. They just heard the voice. And they have to simply obey in faith what they heard. Watch yourselves closely, very carefully, so that you do not become corrupt. Make for yourselves an idol, any, any image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any animal on earth or any bird that flies in the air, like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. Peoples around them, they worshipped the creation. Or they worshipped false gods. Maybe their false gods were a, a combination of different things. We think of the Hindu gods, you know, and they've kind of got the a head of an elephant and a, and a body of a woman, all that kind of thing. But the Lord is to be their focus, the Lord himself. As for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace, out of Egypt, to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Sense of moving there. It's not just, oh, you will be, you will be. But it's also said, you've already become these special people. He's already taken you out. And if you, you're a Christian today, if you believed in the promises of God, uh, that in trusting in Jesus' blood on the cross for you, you have crossed over from death to life, and you've entered into his new life, and you're filled with his Holy Spirit, you can see God is encouraging you today. Be the people of his inheritance as you now are. The Lord is to be their focus. At this point in time, three, three and a half thousand years ago, and our focus today. And when we focus on the Lord instead of ourselves, when we focus on the Lord's strength instead of our feelings, We've really referred to that, haven't we, today? How oftentimes we think, well, how do I feel today? We'll speak to ourselves and we say, the Lord is still God. The Lord is still on the throne. The Lord is Lord of my life. The Lord will be my God. And when we immerse ourselves with who he is rather than who we are, just as our starting point, we don't just say, I feel rubbish today. Therefore, the day is rubbish. No, we say, I know that God is on the throne. And therefore, I will live for him and live to his glory. It's then when we immerse ourselves in who he is, then we will be changed. Then we'll be filled 
then we'll have power and zeal. Something that Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, I sometimes refer to this. And it says there in that verse, Luke 6, 45, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's another way of saying, you talk about what you care about. Yeah? So if, whether you, you, you give them five minutes or 50, uh, what do you talk about? Your words reveal what you love. And if people only ever hear you talk about food and fashion and films or football, they'll never know anything more about you. They'll know, though, what you really love the most. And all this is about life or death. There's nothing in between. Verses 25 to 31. He says this, after you've had children and grandchildren, have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and making any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, will I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you to this day, that you'll quickly perish from this land, you're crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. It really is a life and death issue. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, as it will break you up as a nation. Only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. And there your worship Man-made gods of wood and stone will be no better than they. Those gods which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. But if from there, yes, you seek the Lord your God, and you'll find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when you're in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your forefathers, which he confirmed to them by oath. God's promise. Whether or not they truly love God will be the deciding issue. And for us, it will be the same. Another Verse that I often quote to you from Jesus himself, where Jesus says to his disciples that he's going away. And where he's going, they cannot come yet. Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus comes up with a fantastic and very well-known verse. He says, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he goes on to say, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He promises the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And Judas, not Judas Iscariot, says, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us? and not to the world. No, it's not just for this little pocket of men. It's not just for these few. It's for the many. It's for the many because he says in there in John 14, 23, it's a key verse. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, not just for you 12 disciples performing, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's glorious, isn't it? It's amazing. And what's it all based on? Well, it's based on obedience. You know, the thing we don't particularly enjoy. We say, well, if I, as long as I just turn up, I turn up every so often. And I, no, it's based on obedience because that obedience shows that we love him. Because that's how... God works. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't work according to our plan. He doesn't jump according to 
our command. He tells us who he is um, and, and, and what, he, uh, what he is made of, as it were. You know, that God, yes, God is love, but God is holy as well. And so these things are fantastically important. It does matter what you believe. It does matter what you do. Whether you believe and truly love God will be the deciding issue. For us, it will be the same as it was for the Israelites. And in those last verses, uh, verse 32 to 40, once again, Moses appeals to their sense of reason that the Lord Almighty is completely unique. Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? And don't forget, as this is proclaimed to those people, meeting there, gathered there as a nation on this, this really, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big moment. They're saying, are you going to believe or aren't you? He's setting before them his choice. You're going to believe this Lord who, yes, you can't see, but you see what he can do. He appeals to their sense of reason. Yes, the Lord God Almighty is unique. A psalm, a verse in the Psalms I sometimes refer to, which is Psalm 105 and verse 4 and it says this look to the Lord and his strength seek his face always look to the Lord and his strength not in your own not in your own experience but seek his face always whether you're feeling weak or strong look to the Lord and his strength seek his face always and just in um, in closing, it's one of almost write write down a, a, a quick pricey of what we've done in four little sentences, really short phrases. Serve God, for He has given you everything. Serve God, for He has given you everything. Worship God, for He is worthy. Thirdly, remember God, for he has never forgotten you. Remember God, for he has never forgotten you. And then lastly, and certainly not least, tell your children about God. Because everyone is naturally selfish. Yeah? We don't naturally worship God, we naturally look to ourselves and our own abilities and as we age, our own experience. Yeah, so keep focused upon him. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Yeah, I'll just run through those again if you haven't got them. Serve God, for he has given you everything. Worship God, for he is worthy. Remember God, for he has never forgotten you. Tell your children about God, because everyone is naturally selfish, which puts us in a place where we have to believe the gospel. The wages of sin is indeed death. What we live for results in death. What we live for in this life, this selfishness, because we expect to die, that's a seal on the truth of these words. So we know that we have not done what results in life until we trust in the Lord Jesus, the gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then we can expect life as it would be for the Israelites, believing in the promises of God and being moved into the promised land. Let's pray once more together. Father, we thank you uh, for these amazing words spoken at that time of transition for the Israelite people. They'd been taken through those wanderings in the desert. And they were looking ahead to the, the promised land. You could almost see it, almost touch it. 
Uh, but Lord, that wasn't the, the big prize, as it were. The greatest thing, that they were your people. That they followed you, that they obeyed you, that they loved and served you. And help us to remember that as well. That we're not just here for the good things you give us, but for you yourself. Pray for anybody here who doesn't yet know you. They might trust you for themselves. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.